Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. Michelle Traconis is on trial for conspiring to murder her boyfriend's wife. Now, the prosecution believes that Fotis Dulos actually committed the murder, that he is the one who killed his wife, Jennifer Dulos. But they believe that Michelle Traconis conspired with him to actually commit the murder. And today, for the past two days, we have had by far the most important and damning testimony about Michelle Traconis herself. Up until now, it's been largely evidence related to Fotis Dulos. Now we had a little bit about Michelle Traconis. We're going to talk about that today. The testimony comes from the man who is the most obvious other possible suspect, the person who could have done it. So, but he has immunity and he is pointing the finger at Fotis Dulos and at Michelle Traconis. How do you do? And what does it mean for Michelle? That's what we're, we're going to be talking about tonight. Now you're going to watch some clips and you can decide for yourself what you think. Happy Wednesday, everybody. We're back live um, on our regular schedule and it's good to see everybody in the chat. Glad to have you all here. Now, for two days, we have heard from Pavel Gumieni from Poland. He came to the U.S. in 2000. He's a carpenter, and he worked as a contractor with Four Group, which is Fotis Dulos' company, uh, starting at least in 2014. Then in 2016, when he got his green card, he started working as an actual employee for Fotis' company, Four Group. Pavel is one of the state's most critical witnesses and by far the most controversial. We are going to look at his testimony today and then at the cross-examination we'll look at tomorrow. So we're going to look at four areas today. First, what Pavel said that really hits home with Michelle's case. Now, the prosecution hasn't had that much that directly related to her. Pavel brings some critical new facts. Secondly, we're going to talk about some wild new facts that make Fotis Dulos look more like he may be the person who committed the crime, things that go to the state's case. Third thing, we're going to take a look at why the defense thinks Pavel Gumieni may be the person who committed the murder. And then number four, we're going to talk about what the state is doing to keep the jury from believing that, to protect Pavel Gumieni, and to show that what they believe, which is that the murder was committed by Fotis Dulos. So let's get started on all of that. We've got a bunch to cover tonight. And we're going to start with the testimony about Michelle Traconis, by far the most explosive and direct testimony we have heard so far. Now, there are several different points, but the one I think that hit home the most was the Dulos family dog, Beckham, was dying. He had to be put down. Now, Fotis was cut up about it and wanted Jennifer to let their five children come say goodbye to their dog. Jennifer had moved about an hour and a half south of where Fotis and Michelle Nell lived in Farmington. Uh, she was down in New Canaan. So Jennifer said no, she wasn't going to let the kids come up to say goodbye to the dog. But it's what Michelle said that really raised some eyebrows. So let's go ahead and put a clip up and you can see what I mean. Beckham is ill and he's gonna have to put him to sleep. And um, he said something like, uh, can you believe that Jennifer won't even let the kids come over and say goodbye to, to the dog before we put him to sleep. Did you respond to that comment? I don't remember. And you indicated that the defendant was present. Did she say anything at that point? Yes. Tell the jury what the defendant said. She said um, the she should be buried right next to this dog. And when you say she, what exactly did she say? Um, can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bit should be buried right next to this dog. And what was her... Uh, demeanor like when she said this? I I think she was um, trying to cheer, cheer Dulos up. He was like heartbroken that, that his dog is about to be put down. How did he react when she said this? I believe he, he just looked at, look at her. Now, this so we also heard 
then from, and as you can imagine, a very serious fact that the defense has to deal with. The idea that she would say something that bad, like that bitch should be buried right next to this dog, sounds terrible. Obviously, it's something the defense would have liked to have kept out, but it came in and it's serious suggestion that Michelle had trouble, problems with Jennifer, that they did not get along. Well, it's pretty clear they didn't get along, but that Michelle had real problems with her. There was also some testimony about Jennifer refusing to let the children come for Greek Easter, which was important to Fotis. And the reason for that was that Michelle and her daughter would be there. Now, Michelle and the kids had spent time together before, but now the custody arrangement said that the kids could not be around Michelle at all. And then what was probably the most explosive testimony of all related to Michelle, this is something that Michelle said after Jennifer disappeared. This uh, week month began Monday, May 27th. Did there come a point during that week where you helped the defendant move firewood? Yes. Do you recall exactly what day that was? No. But you can tell us it's sometime the week of May 27th? I believe so, yes. Where were you moving firewood from? He has a um, <clears throat> um, woodshed on the um, right back corner of his property. And did the topic of Jennifer Dulos' disappearance come up? Yes. Who brought it up? Michelle. And do you recall what the defendant said to you about Jennifer Dulos' disappearance? Yes, so Michelle was upset that um, um, her and her daughter pictures were posted by the news online. Um, and she said, uh, I'm, I'm gonna kill that fucking bitch when she's gonna turn up. And um, I said, don't say that. And she said, uh, um, that she's gonna be suing the news. She's writing down who posted what, what pictures. And I believe at that time, Dulos woke out of um, um, dining room door. And then he was asking us, it like became awkward. He asking us, well, what are you guys doing? And, and Michelle said, uh, nothing, we're just talking. Like, this is how the conversation ended. And Mr. Gumeni, um, you've recently disclosed that conversation, is that correct? Yes. Why did you decide to recently tell my office about that conversation? I, um, it, you know, those things, I, I didn't think, People say that those kind of things, and they don't mean it. And um, and I just, I was just wanted to minimize my involvement in all this. And when you say minimize your involvement, what do you mean? Like like I said, I I don't I didn't think that that I was supposed to say those kind of things. I guess. Now, this testimony was a little bit ambiguous because while it suggests hostility between Michelle and Jennifer, uh, there are some things that make it less significant. One is that during her interrogation, Michelle told the police that she sometimes told her own daughter, whom she clearly loved, I think you could tell that from the interrogation, that she wanted to kill her and that she was just talking like, I'm going to kill you. And then she said, and I would say, kill you how? Kill you with kisses. And all the detectives said, oh, yeah, people just say things like that. I mean, the detectives said that during the interrogation. But Pavel's testimony also suggests that Michelle thought Jennifer was not dead and that she would be coming back, which would suggest she wasn't involved in the murder. So the fact that this explosive testimony was provided so late is definitely odd. And it appears it came after the agreement with prosecution. So why would he bother to make it up? And he already had all the agreement he needed, all the immunity that he needed, but now he provided this additional fact. But the defense will talk at length, I'm sure, about the fact that this five years went by, four years went by, and none of this was mentioned. 
Not until the eve of trial did he suddenly remember this new critically important fact that's very difficult and very damaging for Michelle's case. And I want to say thank you to Mitt Spunky and the Summer Golden and to Tammy Miami and the Sammy G. Thank you all of you for your super chats and super stickers. I really appreciate that. So we're now going to shift over and start talking about not just what was said about Michelle, because while that was critically important and something new we hadn't seen a lot of in the case, we also got a lot of new facts tonight about Fotis Dulos that bolstered the state's case that he was involved in her murder. Now, none of these are direct, but they definitely add context to what the state has been talking about. Now, first of all, Fotis was oddly interested in whether Jennifer, his wife, who was now living separately, had video cameras at her new house. Uh, Pavel said he joined in on a conversation Fotis was having with the contractor who actually did the high-end camera and audio work for Ford Group, the construction group owned by Fotis. What did you hear Mr. Dulo saying to Mr. Zeisler? Mr. Dulo pulled out his phone and, and started showing uh, Dan Zeisler pictures of Jennifer um, home, with, uh, which I believe was um, motion detectors, <clears throat> and starts asking him if those are cameras. And what did Mr. Zeisler say? I don't remember. I think he said they are not. And did you participate in the conversation yes. at all? What did you say? I said, I don't think so. I don't think those are cameras. Did you say anything else to Mr. Dulos? Yes, I researched it. Um, I recently saw a commercial of like a small square cameras, inch by inch. I believe they were called cop camera. And I, I showed him that and I said, you know, um, she can record you with anything. Just don't do anything stupid when you go there. And when you say don't do anything stupid when you go there, what were you referring to when you said when you go there? I don't know, like wh whenever he was worried about. Now, that's a strange statement. <laughs> that's just a strange statement to suddenly say to somebody, so don't do anything stupid when you go there almost implies that he thought Fotis might do something to Jennifer. And if so, why didn't he act or say something or say something to Jennifer, whom it appeared he was at least friendly with, had done work for her and helped her over the years? So that was a little bit strange. Fotis also urged Michelle, according to Pavel, to keep Michelle out of things, to leave her out of it when he talked to the police. Pavel testified that when he tried to pick up his Toyota Tacoma the afternoon after Jennifer disappeared, and the police believed that's the vehicle that went down to New Canaan and that was what transported Fotis down to kill Jennifer. So he testified that he had um, that he had seen the key sticking out of the side of his Toyota Tacoma, but later the key was gone when he went to get in the car and take it home. It turned out, he said, that Michelle had the key and she had brought it over. But Fotis didn't want Pavel to tell anyone about that fact. Here's what happened, what he testified. We're discussing a conversation that you had had on May 28th with Mr. Dulos and the defendant. You testified earlier that the defendant had taken your keys from Eaty Mountain Spring Road on May 24th, 2019. Is that correct? Yes. Did the subject of the defendant having your keys come up during this conversation on May 28th? Yes, he did. Can you explain to the jury how it came up? Dulos was asking me, um, how do we, how do I come back from, from New Canaan and how do we met and, and all that on that day. And I told him uh, that uh, once I get to, to 80 Mountain Spring Road to pick up my truck, there was no key for it. And, um, and he told me um, not to mention that, not to mention that Michelle had a key. Now, in his unaliving note, Fotis also made the statement that 
he had nothing to do with the death of Jennifer and said neither did Michelle or Kent May Winnie, who was the third person charged in the conspiracy to murder Jennifer. Now, FOTUS, the third thing that looks bad for FOTUS is that FOTUS asked Pavel to move his red Toyota Tacoma, that truck that we covered on Friday and went into the details about what the state says happened with that truck, asked him to move it to 80 Mountain Spring the night before Jennifer disappeared. Now, surveillance video shows that that red truck left 80 Mountain Spring at about 5.30 in the morning and headed south to New Canaan, where Jennifer lived. We have a whole video on that. Uh, you can I'll link it at the end as soon as this video is finished processing with YouTube, and you can check it out. Now, Pavel testified that this was the one and only time that Fotis ever asked Gumieni to move the vehicle to 80 Mountain Spring. He said he assumed at the time that the reason for it was because the vehicle was leaking oil, and he just was tired of it leaking oil at his home slash the four group office. So the third thing that was pretty significant is that Fotis, helped by Michelle, took Pavel's truck to be washed in detail. Not his own truck, a truck owned by the employee, Pavel. Fotis took the employee's truck to be washed in detail. And obviously a strange fact. So here was Fotis, uh, sorry, Pavel's take on it. How many years had you been leaving your Tacoma at Fort Jefferson Crossing? I'd say like a year, maybe a year and a half. And had Mr. Dulos ever washed your truck? Prior to that day? Yes. No. Had he ever had the interior of your truck cleaned? No. And not really a surprise there, right? I mean, how many employers take their employees' truck out to get it deep cleaned? It's just a strange thing. Now, the prosecution says the reason for that deep clean was that Fotis and Michelle wanted to get rid of the evidence that would link them to the murder of Jennifer Dulos. And so they wanted the truck clean so they could wash off blood, DNA, anything else that would link them. The fourth thing is that Fotis told Pavel not to come to the four group office on the 24th. Now, typically Pavel came every Monday, picked up a car for the week, drove that for the week, then came back on Friday. But Fotis, he said, uh, Fotis told Pavel that he'd be meeting with his divorce lawyer that morning. And I thought actually that this testimony fell a little bit flat. The prosecution wanted to point out that it was the first time Pavel had ever received advanced notice that Fotis was going to be meeting with an attorney. But Pavel said, well, that it was kind of typical whenever Fotis met with an attorney, he would just, he would ask um, Pavel, would you mind going out to lunch? I'm going to be meeting with an attorney. So it didn't seem to me like it was as significant, I think, as maybe the prosecution wanted it to be. The fifth important fact, though, was that Fotis, according to the prosecution, Fotis may have been trying to impersonate Pavel Gumieni, in order to frame him. That has definitely been a suggestion throughout all of this. I made a comment about his hair. And let me, I should give a little more context before I just start playing it. So this is, Pavel is about to see Fotis Dulos on the afternoon of the murder. This is the first time he's seen him since the murder happened. And he does not, Pavel does not yet know that there's been a murder, according to his testimony. But he meets up with him at the works at a work site, and he notices that there's something different about his hair. And when you say you made a comment about his hair, describe his hair for the jury. He was closely shaped. In 2019, how were you wearing your hair? Exactly the same way. So what did you say to Mr. Dulos about his hair? I, I told him, um, what are you doing? You, sh you, you shave your head, um, you wear it, we're wearing dirty or work clothes. You, you're trying to be as handsome as me. And how did Mr. Dulos respond? I think he just smiled. So this was a little bit of a new fact. We had known beforehand that the, the prosecution was going to say 
that the shaved head was one of the things that Fotis did to try to look more like Pavel Gumiani. We hadn't really heard about the work clothes, or at least I hadn't. So they're suggesting he kind of impersonated so that if anyone saw him down in New Canaan where he was murdering his wife, they would think it was Pavel Gumiani down there. That was a surprise to me. I did not realize they actually had a project in New Canaan. So, and it was being supervised by Pavel Gumiani. So that it would be normal for people to see him down in the area. Oh, and let me go ahead and introduce the next one. So the next one is that Fotis just suddenly, urgently wanted Pavel Gumiani to get a new car or at least get new seats in his pickup truck. It was urgent. He just had to do it. He was passionate about this. And that struck Pavel as really strange. Why? Why would his employer suddenly care about the seats in his car? I want to direct your attention now to Thursday, May 30th, 2019. Me, if I wanted to go down the road to the Chevy dealer and see if I can buy a small Chevy. And I told him um, that I don't like Chevys, I like Tacoma. And he, um, he told me, he asked me where, where can I buy seats, junkyard? Um, and I told him, yeah, I think I can get them in the junkyard. He told me, um, Go to junkyard, um, get Tacoma seats or Sumato seats, pay cash, and I'll reimburse you for it. And then there was some um, conversation about work. He asked me what I was, what I was going to do tomorrow, and I told him I have to go to New Canaan. And, and after, um, go to junkyard and buy seats. <clears throat> And, um, and he told me if, if I call you or if I, um, if we talk, talk about it on the phone, um, let's not call it seats, let's call it hardware. So all a little bit strange and sketchy. So it's a big rush. He's got to do it right away. Let's do it tomorrow on your way back from work. Uh, go to a junkyard, get some new seats, and let's don't call them seats. Anytime we're on the phone, just in case, let's call them something different. Let's just call them hardware and I'll pay for it. So the prosecution is saying all of these things seem really kind of strange. And there's more. Uh, Friday, May 31st, correct? Thank you. Yes. What did you say to Mr. Dulos? I just couldn't hold it anymore and I, I just went off on him. I told him, um, what's up with my truck? Why did you clean it? And um, he smiled at me and says, because you were never going to do it. And I told him, seriously, why did you clean my truck? And he says, don't worry about it. There's nothing going on. Um, I went to Jennifer's house for Mother's Day. I gave her a hug. I hold the cat. Um, and then I came back and then I, was, uh, I was having the same clothes and I was driving your truck. Um, there might be hair in it or something. I just want to clean everything. The police might come over, come in. Um, they find something. They're going to destroy my name, destroy the, the company name. No one's going to ever want to build it with me. And I said, why do you want me to change the seats? What's up with the seats? And, and he's, he said, um, like, can we not talk about it? Can you just do it? And then uh, he keep on pressing me and pressing me on it. And then uh, let me let me stop you there. When you say he kept keeps on pressing you and pressing you, can you describe his demeanor for the jury? Yeah, he he like um, he was growing angry, and 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 he keep on saying like you gotta do it. You 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 can you do it? He become. Um, scared and angry when I told him that that um, I went to a couple junk cards. I, I can't change him because I don't physically have him. I, I, I couldn't buy him. And what do you want me to do? And then um, he keep, kept pressing and kept pressing and he was going angry. And, and I finally said, that, 
the only seeds I can think of would be the cayenne seeds. And he says, yeah, yeah, do that. I went to 585 and got into the, the cayenne and, and the better. Let's clarify, 585 was another property owned by the Ford Group. There was a crashed Porsche Cayenne in the garage there. It was dead and I couldn't, the seats were electric. I couldn't move them back and forth to get to the boats. So I was like, screw that. I, I, um, I went back to Fort Jefferson and I told them, <clears throat> listen, the seats are electric. The battery is dead. I can't move them. I can't do it. I'm not gonna do it. He says, no, no, you gotta do it. Um, get the battery booster, um, get the wrench and, and, um, and uh, get him, take him out, change him and, and get rid of him so nobody will ever find him. Obviously lots of really strange kind of sketchy stuff around Fotis's urgent need for his employee to suddenly get new seats. And the story about having hugged Jennifer, about having held her cat, obviously it's not going to play well. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so this story is negative. But next, we are going to talk about the fact that there were also lots of negative facts for Pavel Gumini. We're going to talk about why he is in the defense's mind, someone who easily could be a suspect and maybe should be a suspect. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I want to thank uh, Tyler Tyree and Ada and Marilyn Lugo and Kay Gerber. Thank all of you for your super stickers and for your comments. And I'm so glad to see some people catching the live for the first time. I am glad you are here. Good to have you. Um, so let's talk next about some of the problems that arose for Pavel Gumini. Why, in other words, he is the perfect person for the defense to point to as someone who's guilty. And it's not just the defense concerned about it. Even his own lawyer, which is why he got a written immunity agreement, right? Um, this past December. And we're going to hear a lot about that on the cross-examination by the defense counsel. So here's one reason. Pavel was actually in New Canaan on the day that Jennifer disappeared. One of the projects, and he was in charge of it, he was the manager of it, was at 61 Sturbridge in New Canaan. There was an article at the time of Jennifer's disappearance, I found it looking at it just uh, this morning, that talked about a loud noise that came from the house, that came from the house on the day that Jennifer disappeared. It was early, which wouldn't necessarily correspond to the time frame that's here, but law enforcement searched diligently around that house. They looked at all of it and they did not find any evidence that Jennifer was buried there or they didn't find her body there. Now, the second reason why he's kind of the perfect target is that his wife owned the Toyota Tacoma that the prosecution believes was used to drive down in New Canaan to murder Jennifer. The prosecution is going to do all it can to show that Pavel was not the person driving the Toyota Tacoma on the day of the murder. For example, they, he brought in, Pavel did, a receipt for gas. It showed he had bought 22 gallons. Well, he said the Tacoma only held 17. So 22 gallons meant he had to have been driving the Raptor, which had a bigger gas tank. We can expect some testimony too, based on some hints about tracking. There was a hint we're going to get some cell phone evidence that would show that, or it, you might call it um, evidence from the car itself, that the, his cell phone hooked up to the Ford Raptor. And when he was driving down to New Canaan, that the Ford Raptor is going to show that there was actually a call to one of his, what Pavel's wife's friends. And of course, their, their point is going to be why? Why would Fotis have even been interested in that? Obviously, it would be Pavel who was driving the Ford Raptor down there. The group owned several different vehicles. And there was just an amazing mess of changing. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but there was just crazy mess with changing cars and driving from place to place. And somebody's car was always at the wrong spot. I thought this, this does leave out one possibility, what the prosecution is talking about. And that's that Fotis and Pavel worked together to commit the murder. We don't know yet enough about the evidence to know whether that's a strong argument 
But I would expect to hear some at least threads or hints of that from the defense, but we don't know yet what the evidence is going to be. Now, the third reason I think that Pavel could be considered a target by the defense is that messages and search history were deleted from Pavel's phone. So the and let's go ahead and listen to what he said. Did the police tell you that there had been searches related to the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos on your phone? Um, at some point, yes. Did you do any searches on the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? I'm sure I did, yes. Ever clear your search history on your phone? All the time. Why? I just, I just am in the habit of doing that. I must have been someone told me a long time ago that there might be slowing down my phone or something. So to try to explain the deletions in Pavel's phone, the prosecution also showed that Fotis had possession of the phone for something like five minutes. But it's probably an easier explanation for a jury to believe that Pavel deleted his own information. So in five minutes isn't a lot of time to search through a phone and find everything and delete it. So this remains something that I think the defense will talk about in the cross-examination, and we're going to cover that tomorrow night. So the, the fourth area where Pavel is will be a target for the defense is the issue of the seats. Now, of course, there was testimony from Pavel that his employer, Fotis, was just weirdly obsessed with the idea that he needed to change these seats. But let's also listen to something he said. The Ford Focus seats that you removed from your Toyota Tacoma, you indicated that you put them next to the Tacoma? Yes. Can you tell the jury why you did that? I wanted to um, keep him just in case if there was anything going on with the truck. If, if the police is asking about it, I just wanted to keep him next to it. He said that back on his hill. And but you can see where there's some room here for the defense. I mean, after all, Pavel went to three different junkyards. He testified looking for seats. For someone who didn't care about having new seats at all, that was a lot of work. And it took him a while to tell the police. It wasn't when they first showed up. He didn't say it right away. It took a while. He even went so far as to follow them in his truck without the seats bolted in because he was in mid-process of trying to swap, swap out new seats and put them in there. So he drove that truck because his wife's vehicle wasn't available. And they said, follow us over here. We want you to show us something. So he followed them in the truck with the seats not bolted in. And in fact, we saw in the pictures from law enforcement that one of the seats was held up by a bucket so it was only after they then handed him the search warrant. He's away from his house. He's driven without bolts and they hand him a search warrant. And then he tells them, okay, I want you to know the seats are different. So those are all things that the defense is going to talk about. And let's talk now about some of the things that the prosecution is going to do to protect him and to try to um, to, to try to help him. And I, th I think the things we've talked about so far include, first of all, immunity. They gave him immunity. He had oral immunity. And as of December, this past December, he was given actually written immunity. And that says that he will not be prosecuted unless he perjures himself or acts in contempt of court. So he has motive then to help the prosecution. But they've also done things to protect him in terms of his testimony, like they spent a lot of time today showing photographs and things that would suggest everything he had said was true. He said, I pulled into this driveway at about this time, and they would show surveillance video showing his truck pulling in about that time. He would say, this truck followed me, and they would show that truck following him on surveillance video. And they did that repeatedly. It was pretty effective. So we're getting near the end. So if you have questions, this is a great time to put them in. I try to uh, save that for the end. And if you would put question marks at the beginning, it really helps me spot it in the chat. So, cause it'll be mixed in with people's comments as well. So there was one thing that I just had to share with y'all because I thought it was absolutely crazy. I thought, okay, there just need to be some new charges around this. So 
this is what they described. I mean, I wrote it down. I'm like, is this really I, I, trying to follow the testimony? This is what I think they said anyway. So Pavel gets back from New Canaan on the day that Jennifer disappeared. No one's at the Ford Group office. So he drives the Raptor to 585 Deer Cliff, one of their properties, the Ford Group properties, to get a ramp to load his dirt bike. And then he drove the Raptor to 80 Mountain Crossing to see if the keys were there with the Tacoma, which is what he wanted to drive. Now, the Tacoma and the white Jeep and the Chevy Suburban were there, as are Fotis and Michelle, and now the black Raptor is there too. So Pavel is in the Raptor and Fotis is in the black Suburban, and they go back to Ford Jefferson. At the time before he leaves, Fod uh, Pavel says he notices the key sticking out of the door of the Toyota Tacoma, so he knows I can come back and drive that. It won't be a problem. Michelle drives back to 80 Mountain Spring, uh, but, okay, hold on, uh, Pavel stops by 585 Deer Cliff to leave the two by one and the toolbox. And then he gets to four and you don't have to follow this. The whole point of it is that it's mystifying. So I'll just keep going and you'll see what I mean. Pavel gets to four Jefferson crossing and Fotis is there. And then Fotis and Pavel drive back to 80 mountain spring and the keys are not in the Tacoma door. So Michelle drives back to 80 mountain spring with the key and Fotis knew she had it. And the question that the prosecution was asking was how and why did Michelle have it anyway? So then Fotis in the Raptor follows Pavel in the Tacoma to 580, it gets ridiculous, to 585 Deer Cliff, where he left the Tacoma and got a ride to Fort Jefferson and <laughs> Pavel gets his dirt bike and then rode the dirt bike back to 585. But first, he had trouble starting the dirt bike at Fort Jefferson Crossing and he had to use the battery booster there. And then Pavel drove to 585 Deer Cliff and loaded the dirt bike and put the two by 10 right next to it. I was like, what? What? What are these people doing? I mean, I really thought the state has got to consider some new charges. Like maybe they should all be charged with wasting gas because this is just crazy. I mean, that is craziness. And with having way too many vehicles, they all need to just have a vehicle and do it. It's so inefficient. But anyway, I thought y'all would enjoy that because I wrote that down and I, I was like, wait, is this adding up to as much as it seems like it is? Because it seems completely crazy. So let me head over and look at some of your questions. And I want to say too, I hate the delay in memberships. I know that it's been delayed and it's super frustrating, but they are coming. <laughs> Just trust me on that. Trust me on where it, it's very, very close and we will see that. Okay, so I'm going back to see how far back the questions go. All right, wait, I, I don't know if that was when exactly when I said it, but I see one from um, Cognac Hobo. Could Pavel be charged at a future date if the police believe he was part of the conspiracy? And the answer to that is no, he can't be because he has that immunity. He has that in signed, it's in writing, and it says unless he comes in and lies to the court, then no, he can't be. He is not going to be charged for the conspiracy or anything related to the murder of Jennifer Dulos. So Rosie Redleg wants to know, did any surveillance video show the driver or passenger of the red truck? Very, very unfortunately not. We had lots and lots of surveillance video that showed what the prosecution says is the red truck, but never, not once, did we have any Hint, even so much as whether there were two people in it or just one, or was it a man or a woman, we got nothing. So it was always just the outside of the truck zipping by somewhere. And that's all we had. Kelly wants to know, do you think Kent May Winnie will testify? Good question. Kent May Winnie is the third person charged in the conspiracy. And in addition to Fotis, who is no longer alive, Michelle, who is charged and on trial right now, I honestly think yes, but I don't know. Obviously, I'm just pulling that out of thin air. I don't really know if he'll testify or not. There have been rumors that he might come in and testify, and part of that would be to get a good deal. He struck a deal on another case with the prosecution, so in that case, so maybe you know he could do that. He's an attorney and and may have you know thought through this. I don't know. We photo gal wants to know: Is the defense trying to point a potential finger at Pavel? Or are they really trying to say there's no real evidence toward Michelle Traconis to clear her name? You know, I honestly think it's both, we, we photo gal. I think they're trying to say both. 
you know, if anything, this guy isn't trustworthy. This guy may have been involved. There's a lot of reason to be suspicious of him. Oh, I should pull that out. Let me pull that out. <laughs> okay. So now I can talk to y'all again. Uh, so I, that's part of it. But I do think they definitely are saying there's no evidence about Michelle. You can talk about Fotis all you want, but he's not here and he's not on trial. What's your evidence about Michelle? And they've done, I think, a really good job of bringing that back and back to the jury. The prosecution went through a whole lot of DNA and blood evidence, and the defense had to keep bringing it back too, but it wasn't blood or it wasn't Michelle's DNA or it wasn't even DNA. And when you tested it, nothing matched any of the people who might have been involved in the case. So let's see. Uh, next question would be, I'm looking for those question marks. I may have gone too far back to start with. Okay, Robert wants to ask, why is his testimony about his conversations with Fotis considered hearsay? I think you mean, why is it not considered hearsay? Well, he's in court to testify about it. So it's not hearsay because Pavel is actually here testifying. So he can talk about what he said. Now, Fotis is a part of the conspiracy and therefore, they have let his statements in. There was a big fight about that today. From a lawyer standpoint, it was really interesting. And the, it was actually yesterday, I guess. But the big fight about it was whether or not the judge needed to decide in advance that there was a conspiracy going on before he let in this hearsay testimony. And the judge said, I can't decide that. The jury decides that. And the defense said, well, you have to make at least an initial finding of that, or you can't let in the testimony. Huge appellate issue. You can kind of mark this one already. That's one that will go up on appeal if, because the judge let the hearsay in. All right. Stephen wants to know any romantic history between Pavel and Fotis. Hmm. Um, so uh, Stephen believes he has some inside information I don't have about uh, the proclivities, sexual orientation of some of the people involved. I don't really know. I mean, I have no information about that. So I can't really answer as far as any of their romantic um, interplay. Had any of them been connected to anybody else? Nobody in particular wants to know, was Fotis even home the night before the crime or could he have been in Jennifer's house the night before hiding? Certainly could have been. There wasn't any furniture there, I don't think. They were getting ready to sell it. So the fact that there was no furniture there would make it not a very pleasant evening sleep. But I, you know, certainly I thought about that too. There was no video evidence showing a car going over to 80 Mountain Spring at say five or 4.30 in the morning, but they did point out it was dark. So we might not have seen that anyway. If they had actually been, if the surveillance video had caught it, it would have been, or potentially caught it, it would have been dark. So there would have been nothing to see, nothing to know about. So um, let's see. Uh, Sybil C wants to know, are you pointing this witness? Are you... I'm not sure. I'm not sure what Sybil is asking me. I'm not sure about that, Sybil. Maybe put a, a little bit more in there. I'm not sure of the context of what you're saying. Uh, Molly, how is this not okay? We talked about the hearsay. Um, Carol, did anyone check under the wood pile? <laughs> I think I think law enforcement checked absolutely everywhere they could think of. They used dogs. They used equipment. They. I don't think there were many stones they left unturned. They tried really hard to find whoever did this. So it was definitely a thing. Annie Kay wanting to know, Pavel was at risk of losing his job, medical insurance, green card, and of deportation, not only a scapegoat, but a foreigner at risk, threatened by POTUS and law enforcement. What are your thoughts? So Annie, that's definitely something that he even talked about during his testimony. He said that he felt that Fotis said, don't tell the police anything because they'll take your green card if they think you're involved, and which would be very frightening to him. And he had this good employment. He said several times he didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to make Fotis angry at him. And he was scared by him. So the, he was definitely in a, and I think it probably is one of the reasons that law enforcement decided to work with him is because he definitely seemed like he was under a lot of pressure and they believed he was just trying to do what he could in the situation, that he wasn't 
involved and that he was being forced into this spot by Fotis Dulos. And they thought Fotis, I think, was the more important person involved in this who needed to be convicted. And I think that's what they were aiming for. Yes, Art Nixie asked me, will you be doing the deep dive on Michelle's interviews? I definitely am. I've already got it partway done. Um, and um, Art Nixie's looking forward to that. I'm glad you are. I'm looking forward to it too. It, really interesting information. I will tell you one of the reasons I've been sort of delayed on it. The audio on it was appalling, just absolutely appalling. And so I, what I've been trying to do is go through and try to hear what they're saying and put a transcript in it for you. So you can kind of understand what's said. Um, I had an AI go through and do it and <laughs> it was not all correct. Let's just say not correct. So I've been working on that. And so that will still come. All right, let's see. Do I have anybody else? And I see too, I've got another super chat I need to thank. Leaves of Silver. Oh, what a pretty name. Thank you very much. Um, so let me head back over and see if there are any last questions. Maybe answer one or two more. And we will. Oh, wait. Nope, that was Annie's. There's Leaves of Silver. Okay, Leona Harati. Was Pavel ever considered a suspect? I think the answer would have to be yes. I don't think they would have given him immunity if he hadn't at least been worried that he was considered a suspect. And so uh, I think they eliminated him as a suspect. They no longer believed he at least was high up in the scheme that they believed happened. They don't think he was truly involved. So I think that was part of it. Todd Moore wants to know, do we get to know why he's getting immunity? I mean, immunity would just be an agreement between them, an agreement that the prosecution won't, won't prosecute him for his role, anything to do with Jennifer Dulos' murder and his agreement that he will testify truthfully at the trial. So it's, it's an agreement. There's not technically a why. It's just in the same sense that there's not always a why behind an agreement. It's just two sides that have agreed to something. Now, why did they choose to do it with him? I think it's because they felt like they needed some of the information he had in order. And I think, I think they must have thought he really was not involved and they needed his information and they needed his information to deal uh, with Fotis Dulos no longer around to be prosecuted and Michelle Traconis, who is. Okay, last question. Karen Hicks wants to know, is the defense team trying to break the prosecutor's rhythm with all the objections? Driving me crazy. It is a lot of objections. But here is my opinion on that, Karen. The judge has, they've asked, the defense at least that I've seen several times has said, can we have a continuing objection? And that's where they don't have to stand up and object every time. They can just sit there and the judge, the court, and the appellate court already know that they're objecting to whatever the issue is. But the judge said to that, and he's right about this, he said, that's a trap, basically. That's a trap for the judge and for the prosecutor because you aren't standing up every time. So there could be something wrong. And I miss it. I don't think of it. And you tell the appellate court, oh, well, we already had a standing objection. So the court said, I want to hear your objections every time so I can make a ruling in context. So that's the reason why it was so, why it was looked at so diligently. So I want to thank Mitt Spunky and Summer Golden and Tammy Miami and Sammy G and Taylor Tyree and Ada, Ada JD, I, I noticed that now, and Marilyn Lugo and Kay Gerber and Leaves of Silver. Thank all of you for your super chats, your super stickers. I really appreciate that. I want to thank um, Marlon and Mama Pinks, I know she um, was trying to get on the live. I don't know if she did or not, but um, I so appreciate the moderating that they do time after time. Memberships really are coming. Trust me on that. <laughs> it's going to happen. If you would, be sure to hit the like button on the video. It'll really help it get out to more people. And subscribe. We're covering this case. We cover all kinds of cases that are in the news. Tomorrow night, we'll be doing another live stream at 7 p.m., and we're going to be covering the cross-examination of Pavel Gumini. And I will see you tomorrow. 7 p.m. Eastern.